Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica. I am a director for the Python Software Foundation. I'm also an organizer for the Boston Python User Group, which happens to be the largest Python user group in the world. I'm also a core maintainer for Twisted, uh, which we'll talk about a good bit this hour. As a quick show of hands, I think this is the only talk about Python at this conference. Raise your hand if you use Python regularly. OK, great. Cool. OK, great. OK, so what I would like to talk about with you today is um, architecting an event-driven networking framework, in particular this framework called Twisted Python. So let's say that I, have, I am an ambitious person. and I have a lot of things that I want to build. I'm not just building a website. I might need to build a mail server, an IRC chat bot, a DNS resolver. Maybe I'm writing custom protocols. I need client, event-driven clients and servers for custom protocols. Um, and I want to build all of these things in Python. And additionally, I'd like them to be cross-platform. So not just platform in the sense that they, they run on OS X and Linux uh, and Windows, but in the sense that they um, use the best underlying operating system exposed um, asynch asynchronous I.O. primitives to be uh, you know, efficient. Um, hopefully, I'm going to write RFC compliance code without um, drowning myself in 10 different RFCs. Um, hopefully, I'm writing um, testable code and code that is deployable using some sort of standardized interface. Um, and hopefully, if I'm writing clients and servers for the same protocol, if they share a lot of logic, hopefully I can reuse that code um, in the protocol implementations and in testing. So I have sort of lofty goals. I want to write a bunch of protocols, and I want them to have these properties. Um, what are my realistic options in Python? Um, so a funny thing about Python, which you may know or you may not know if you don't use Python regularly, is that um, Python, the core language, does not have uh, built-in asynchronous I.O. primitives. Um, so if you come from JavaScript or some other language like that, um, you may think that's really funny. <laughs> this is not something that the language has evolved yet. Uh, but it is a reality. So this has meant that um, an interesting ecosystem of third-party libraries have evolved to handle event-driven programming and asynchronous I.O. in Python. So I have my lofty goals for web and mail and DNS servers and clients. What are some of my options? Well, starting at a really low level, um, one thing I could use, a part of the standard library, is something called async core. And async core is a really thin wrapper around low-level socket APIs. Um, so if you squint a little, this is an actual async core echo server. And if you, you can sort of get the sense, you know, the details don't matter, but you sort of get the sense that this is still pretty low-level stuff. Like, I'm still creating sockets, and I'm having to set up listening and handling events and all of that. So async core is, is very low level, and it gives you a little bit of rope. It gives you an event loop, and it gives you some um, callback mechanisms. But you're mostly on your own for building an application on top of an event-driven, and you know, an event loop on top of a socket API. So for my lofty goals, this is probably a little too low level. Another event, which is kind of interesting, is this library called coroutine. I'm sorry, this library called gevent. Gevent is a coroutine-based library that uses greenlets. Uh, greenlets are like uh, micro-threads, and they came out of the Stackless Python project. Um, and they give you a, a synchronous API on top of the lib event event loop. Uh, and this is, this is an interesting, kind of crazy library. The way that this is actually achieved is by um, monkey patching the underlying standard library socket implementations. Um, so that you end up using this greenlit-friendly version of sockets instead of the built-in standard li li lib ones. So gevent could be an interesting uh, choice. Um, gevent is used by various interesting um, projects like ZeroMQ. Um, could be could be good. Could be a good fit. Maybe maybe not. Um, or I could ab abandon my lofty goals and just say um, maybe I want to use uh, you know an application layer protocol specific library. Like maybe all I really want to care about at the end of the day is an event-driven web server. And I could just use something like Tornado. Like its whole job is to be an event-driven web server. So some application specific or protocol specific uh, library. OK, so these are all parts of the ecosystem. But for my lofty goals, it might be worthwhile to pursue um, a bit of a beefier framework. And this framework is called Twisted. And Twisted is kind of an old project, actually. It recently celebrated its 11th birthday. Um, so it started in the early 2000s with some explicit lofty goals, some goals to be um, explicitly an event-driven platform for producing clients and servers for a variety of networking protocols, um, high-level RFC-conforming APIs, 
A very batteries included philosophy matching that of Python, the parent language. Um, and the goals of being general and extensible. So um, not only can I use um, uh, APIs for common protocols off the shelf, but I can build my own in a consistent way. So these are the lofty goals of Twisted. They kind of match my goals, so this is what we're going to explore today. So Twisted, okay, what is it? <laughs> uh, so Twisted is an event-driven networking framework. It's a way to write clients and servers. There are a lot of pieces. So we're gonna break down sort of the broad strokes architecture of this framework. Now to motivate this, let's make sure that we're all on the same page though. So we talk about this event-driven programming model. Let's just make sure we understand why we care about that. So an event-driven model is in contrast to a couple of other common programming paradigms. So the most simple is probably a, a single-threaded synchronous program. You have a program that executes from top to bottom. If you have some expensive operation like a, a database query or a network request, um, you may just have to block and wait for that request to complete before you can carry on making progress in your program. Fair enough. Uh, this may not be that time efficient, but it's certainly easy to reason about. Now another option may be to um, split out these tasks into different threads of control, threads that are managed by your operating system. And your operating system can schedule these uh, interleaved on one or many processors, uh, one or many CPUs, to make sure that um, when possible, you can hopefully make some progress on one of these threads. Um, so this may be more time efficient than its synchronous counterpart, but it does add some mental overhead. You now have to worry about how to reason about um, this threaded program in a way that isn't necessarily um, a serial read through the file, and you have to protect access to shared resources. So if you have concurrent access to shared state, you have to manage the locking primitives or whatever to make sure that um, that data isn't getting corrupted. Uh, and then a third option is this event-driven model which in some ways is the best of both worlds. You're back to a single thread of execution, so you, have, um, you don't have to worry about managing concurrent access to shared resources, um, but you also um, can try to not block when possible. So instead of um, blocking on expensive events, you can yield time to an event loop that will um, let you register callbacks to process events when they're actually available. And you can have an event loop going through and trying to make progress where possible, um, on independent tasks in a single thread of execution. So um, event-driven programs may be a good match for uh, applications where you have many tasks that are fairly independent um, that can probably happen independently. So these are our three models, and um, if you've ever had really horrible, buggy, threaded programs, you may have been scared away from using threads, and an event-driven model may be a good alternative choice for you. And that's what Twisted is based on. So if you have an event-driven model, you need some kind of event loop that handles listening for and dispatching events for processing. And Twisted has that. So the core of Twisted, the event loop, is called the reactor. And this is some pseudocode for what the reactor essentially accomplishes. All it does is it waits for events, and it dispatches them to callbacks that have, are waiting to process those events. And the Twisted, event, the Twisted Reactor knows about various types of events. It knows about network events and file system events and timers. Um, and it provides a uniform abstraction on top of the underlying operating system APIs. So for example, on Linux, maybe um, you've used the select or epoll um, API for handling asynchronous I.O. And maybe on Windows, you've used I.O. completion ports. And maybe on FreeBSD derivatives, you've used KQ. These all have their own interfaces. And um, Twisted provides a, a, a a standard API on top of the underlying operating system APIs. So this is our reactor. This is our event loop that's going to take care of events processing for us. In addition to this event loop, this reactor, we have this idea of a transport. A transport is very simple. It's like the tiniest bit of reusable code that represents the connection between two endpoints communicating across a network. So when we think about um, you know, the OSI model, we think about transport layer protocols like TCP for a reliable stream-oriented protocol. We think about UDP. We think about SSL for an encrypted channel. We think about Unix sockets. These are all transports in the twisted sense. So in addition to a reactor and to transports, this is, a really, this is the, you know, the really simple basic uh, transport API for just sending bits out, um, out to the network. So in addition to transports, you have a higher level concept of a protocol. So once you have received some bytes from the network, protocols describe how to process these network events. 
And so these map to, the, in the OSI model, you know, the, the uh, application layer protocols that we use every day as we use the internet. So when we use HTTP to browse the web, or we use POP3 or IMAP to check our mail, um, you know, if we use IRC, DNS, these are all application layer protocols and, and protocols in the twisted sense as well. And so protocols register callbacks with this reactor, with this event loop, um, so that they can be notified when data has come in across the network that is ready to be processed. And a really important idea about transports and protocols is that they're totally decoupled. So you have a TCP transport, and many protocols could sit on top of that transport. So HTTP and IMAP and DNS, you know, they all use TCP as a transport layer protocol under the hood. And, and keeping them decoupled means they're, you know, they're pluggable, you can, you can plug in protocols on top of transports, and it also makes it really good for testing. Because if your transport is just used to shove bytes out to the network, that means instead of shoving bytes out of socket, you can just shove bytes into a string for inspection. So this decoupling is a really good idea from an architectural perspective because it makes testing and code reuse easier. Okay, so we have three primitives here. We have a reactor, we have transports, we have protocols. Let's actually build something in Twisted. So here is probably the simplest thing that you can do. Here's a, a TCP echo server, and here's the whole thing, minus the imports, but here is the entire thing, written in the sort of idiomatic way that you would write Twisted programs. We can see that we have a protocol. We're sub, we, our echo protocol, it's very simple, all it does is echo back what you sent it, but our echo protocol subclasses this protocol base class. Um, Twisted likes to use factories to build instances of protocols. We see that we have a transport, an underlying TCP transport, and we have a reactor that is, so, and we have an underlying TCP transport, and we have this protocol that has registered callbacks with the reactor to be notified when data has been received across that transport ready for processing. And that's all it is. So this is a, this is a you could take this code and you could plop it in a file on a server that's out on the internet, and you could run it, and you could connect to it on, you know, with Telnet or whatever on port 8000, and it would talk back to you. And this is totally event-driven um, with very little work on your part. So that's pretty sweet. And what's cool is once you get comfortable with these primitives, this reactor and this idea of a transport, and this idea of a protocol, um, servers all start to look very similar. They're structured very similarly. So for example, what if we wanted a UDP echo server instead? It looks very similar. Now the protocol is a little bit different. So TCP is a stream-oriented protocol, so we had this, this one protocol base class. Um, UDP is a datagram-oriented protocol, so we have this datagram protocol um, base class. But otherwise, it looks pretty similar. We have a transport we're writing out through our UDP transport. We have a reactor with which we've registered callbacks to handle events as they come in. And we could run this too. What if we wanted an encrypted underlying channel? We could actually completely reuse the echo code from the TCP server from before. So our echo class and our echo factory are completely the same. All that changes is a little bit of extra context that gives um, the transport enough information to produce an encrypted channel along which you're shoving out the bytes. So that same reactor from before, but using this encrypted underlying transport. So that's pretty sweet. It was not a lot of work, not a lot of conceptual overhead to do these things. And it's all using th you know, three ideas, a reactor, a transport, and a protocol. Okay, so there's one thing that we haven't totally talked about yet, which is somehow happening under the hood. So when you have this event loop and you're registering callbacks with this event loop, you need some way of managing these callbacks. So there, you know, there, uh, well, you need some way of managing these callbacks. So, 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 so somehow, and in particular, if we were um, constructing more complicated protocols, if we were writing our own protocols, um, we might need to take care of registering callbacks ourselves. So far, we've been using some of the sort of high level given APIs, but if we were designing our own protocols, we may need to do a little bit more work ourselves. So the question is, what does managing callbacks look like in the twisted world? And to motivate this, let's sort of start from the beginning with callbacks. So in a synchronous program, in a single thread asynchronous program, you just run from top to bottom, right? So let's say we have a hypothetical uh, blocking get page request. Get page downloads a resource from the internet. Um, we can try to download the URL, or the resource at that URL. We can process the resulting page, or in the event of an error, we can log the error, and in all cases, let's finish processing, let's exit the program. You know, this, 
we, it runs from top to bottom, and it's wrapped in this try except finally block in a way that is very familiar to us since we do synchronous programming all the time. No, but what happens if we have to do this in, a, in an event-driven world, in a world where you have this event loop that's happening and you have to somehow register callbacks with an event loop to let you know when uh, an asynchronous result is available for processing? So let's pretend now that our get page is not blocking anymore. It's some non-blocking event, and eventually it will produce an asynchronous result for us to process. How do we tweak our example to fit that model? Well, one way to do this, sort of the most straightforward way then, is to tell get page what to do in the success and error cases, right? So we can pass a success callback and an error callback, I might call that an error back, to get page. And now when the resource becomes available, get page will, will dispatch to the relevant callback, the relevant function, what to do next. And this is okay. This is okay in simple cases. But what happens in a, in a, uh, a framework like Twisted is you end up getting uh, callback proliferation very quickly. You know, maybe there are many levels of processing as you bubble up through the network stack. Um, you know, maybe process page can succeed or fail. And then maybe there's another processing step beyond that. And if you, know, if you forget to call finish processing one of these things, you're going to never stop the reactor and you loop forever. And at that point, you're trying to debug something that gets complicated really quickly. So what tends to happen in event-driven systems and in frameworks like this is you need some way of managing callbacks. Having them spread all over the file like this and passed around as arguments to functions becomes unwieldy really quickly. So back in the early 2000s, and keep in mind, this is, this is at this point, a long time ago. So back in the early 2000s, Twisted quickly encountered this callback proliferation problem and needed to do something about it. So we came up with an idea. We came up with the idea of an abstraction to this notion of a result that doesn't exist yet. You might call it a promise, a promise that a function will have a result at some point. And this is an object that asynchronous functions can return. And the idea was, well, okay, we have this object, and this is an object that asynchronous functions can return, and let's attach the callbacks to this object instead. Instead of splattering callbacks everywhere or passing them as arguments to asynchronous functions, let's centralize all of that management in a single idea, in this idea that we're going to call a deferred. So a deferred is both an object and a, uh, an object representing a result that will eventually come in, and it's also a way of managing callbacks. So here's what uh, our get page example would look like a little bit in the twisted world. Get page is a hypothetical example here, but get page is a hypothetical non-blocking um, asynchronous uh, function. So in this case, get page is back to taking a single argument, just URL, great. Get page now instead though of returning a resource, it returns a deferred. It returns a deferred immediately, and we add callbacks to the deferred to say how to process the result in the error, success and error cases. And one of the cool things about deferred is that you can chain callbacks. So we have one level of callbacks registered here, and we can have another level of callbacks registered here, and we can keep doing that. We can chain the results of, defer, the results of callbacks to each other for sophisticated event processing. And this is what a deferred looks like on the inside. It's actually two parallel callback chains. So you register level by level, levels of processing, and then when an asynchronous result finally resolves, either the success chain or the error chain gets invoked. So you know, if, if get page succeeds and it returns with the, the HTML text of a web page, that gets passed in to, as an argument to the first callback of the callback chain, that does some processing. That callback returns a result which is passed in as the first argument to the next callback in the callback chain, et cetera. So you have this nice chaining of results, and everything is nice and orderly now, right? Now we know how to keep track of multiple levels of callback in one place. So deferreds have a simple callback API. You can register callbacks, you can register airbacks, you can register them together, and you can register um, something that is analogous to the finally part of a try except finally block, adding a, you know, a finishing function to both callback chains. So looking back at our example, so what we see now is if we we have this deferred that is returned by get page. Add callbacks registers simultaneously at, you know, on each side of the callback chains, or sorry, on each side of the deferred, a process page in the success callback chain, and log error in the airback chain. And then we use add both to add finish processing to both chains. 
So this is what the internals of our get page deferred would look like at the end of the day. And what's nice about this idea is it gets us back closer to the semantics of synchronous programs. So one of the problems with callback proliferation is like it's hard to know, it's hard to keep track of everything and it's hard to ensure that you've always done all of your cleanup functions and all of the various branching cases and what, if, what happens if you invoke a call back twice on accident or you don't invoke one at all on accident. Um, so this gets you closer to the semantics of, of a, a synchronous program. You have an add callback method that is like try. You have an add airback method that is like accept. You have an add both method that is like finally. And deferreds enforce that they can only be fired once. If you try to fire them again, it will result in an error. So this helps you keep track of what is going on and it helps remove a class of errors involving accidentally repeatedly calling callbacks. So that's nice. And this is easier for me to reason about as someone who's more used to synchronous programming. Um, if this API looks familiar to you, um, there are reasons for that. So it's funny, so Twisted is not a language that's known necessarily for being like a hotbed of asynchronous primitive activity. But this was in like 2001, 2002, when the deferred was conceived within the Twisted project for handling this callback proliferation. And if you think, like 2002, that's when Java.NIO came out. So 2000, 2001, 2002, that's, that's a long time ago at this point. So this was an interesting and a useful abstraction, and it was so interesting and useful that it was exported to a variety of libraries. So if you've ever played with MochiKit or Dojo, for example, they have exactly this deferred API, and they even cite Twisted in their API docs. And these things evolve, you know, Dojo has changed some of the naming, has changed some of the semantics, um, jQuery has evolved um, a slightly different but similar in spirit um, deferred or promise idea. But this idea of having an object that you focus the management of callbacks on has, been, uh, has definitely had staying power, um, and you see in a lot of frameworks today. So that's kind of cool. Okay, so we have a reactor, we have an event loop, we have these deferreds for managing the callbacks that are inevitable in these event-driven systems, and we have these two good ideas, transports and protocols, for building up sophisticated client and server applications. Great. Now I did say that Twisted was a batteries included framework like Python, so what does that mean? Um, that means that uh, we would not be satisfied with just these simple protocol implementations for you to have to do a lot of work on top of to build up um, robust production grade services. So let's see a couple of examples. So on top of the sort of basic HTTP protocol API, Twisted builds even higher level um, APIs that know about things like session management and other, and, and resources and other high level concepts of the HTTP application layer protocol. So if you wanted to write a simple HTTP server in Twisted, you wouldn't use a protocol directly, you would use something like this, some of the higher level APIs. And this is again, this is a complete HTTP server, even including the imports this time. Um, we still have our same reactor from before. We see that we're listening on the on you know, we're listening for TCP connections on port 80. Uh, we still have factories like before, but we're using a higher level constructs at this point to achieve um, you know a, a, definitely a useful server with very few lines of code. So this will serve both static and dynamic content on port 80. You could literally dump this out on the internet and run it, and it would work. Well, assuming that directory existed, yeah. So that's pretty cool. So Twisted, on top of the basic protocols, gives you some very high-level protocol-specific APIs for getting work done efficiently. Uh, so similarly, let's say that you really want to write an IRC server, and I cannot tell you how many people want to write IRC servers and bots. I spent all day in the Twisted IRC channel helping people write their servers and bots, which is pretty great. Um, okay, but you want to write an IRC server. You know, what you probably don't want to do is the, 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 the sort of base level of group and login and logout account management that is common to most chat protocols. So what Twisted does is it has a sub-project called Twisted Words that has already built up a nice abstract and extensible set of um, classes for building chat-like protocols. And this abstraction is used by its IRC implementation and its XMPP implementation and its AOL Oscar implementation, et cetera, et cetera, so that you don't have to do very much work at all if you want to use a vanilla version of one of these protocols. So this is a, now admittedly bare bones, but a totally functional IRC server in Twisted. You could run this right now. It will authenticate users based on passwords in a, in a passwords file. Um, we see the same reactor and listen TCP from before. 
but we take advantage of the really high level uh, you know, chat protocol specific features like group management and the, the ability to create rooms or channels um, that Twisted gives us. So we get to use that all for free. And that's pretty sweet. And these are just two examples. Um, you know, I, I can go all day with it. Because you know, these are just a subset of the protocols that ha uh, Twisted has built in high level support for. And so in addition to building these clients and these servers, another thing that's important to us with this batteries included philosophy is that you can actually do the things that production grade servers need to do. And these are things that are sometimes tricky to do in these event driven non-blocking systems. Like how do you talk to a database from within Twisted? Because that's a blocking, it's an expensive operation, right? You know, how do you schedule events for the future? How do you do, deal with authentication? So Twisted has made a point of giving you enough rope to do all of these things very efficiently. So Twisted comes with a pluggable authentication backend that you can use to you know, authenticate users from files and from databases and from other sources without you having to worry about doing it correctly in a non-blocking way. Uh, Twisted makes it easy to, if you need to, use threads and processes safely within this event-driven model. And super important, geez, let me emphasize this, enough, um, it's really important to test your programs. You don't get a buy on this because you're using a framework or because it's event driven and that might be hard. Um, so Twisted comes with a framework called Trial for testing your event driven programs. And Trial understands the reactor, Trial understands deferreds, it knows how to wait for them to complete if it needs to. So this makes testing your code very easy, unit testing your code very easy, and that's definitely a good idea. But there's more. <laughs> um, so we have this TCP echo server from before, right? It would be nice to be able to deploy this in a standardized fashion. Like, okay, I have a server, but do I really, like, do I just run something at the command line and just like have it sit there in a screen session or how do I actually deploy this thing, right? So um, Twisted also provides facilities for handling the deployment and management of your production grade services. So this was our echo server from before, right? What we can do is we can pull out the protocol specific details, so this echo class and this echo factory class, into their own module. And then we can deal with the deployment details in a separate file that implements a very simple API for a twisted application. And once we have this twisted application file, we can run it from the command line using a utility called Twisty. So Twisty takes care of things like the reactor, starting and stopping the reactor, um, so that you can deal, you can focus with just those sort of the protocol level details of your code. And Twisty also gives you a bunch of things for free. So if you see here in this output, um, this logging that my echo server seems to have grown, I didn't write any code for that. This, was, this is the literal code that you would drop into a file to run this echo server.tac file. So Twisty, um, allows you to take advantage of underlying logging facilities in Twisted to get logging for free in your Twisted applications. You can use Twisty to uh, daemonize your applications, to profile them or run them under a debugger. You can use that pluggable authentication backend that I talked about earlier to, from the command line, specify what type of authentication you want to use. Maybe you're going to use a database, maybe you're switching to a file, maybe you're testing and you have an in-memory database. So these are all things that you can do in a way that is nicely decoupled from your protocol logic using this Twisted application infrastructure and the TwistD command line utility. So that's pretty sweet. But wait, there's more. Uh, so Twisted is very serious about this batteries included thing, right? So in addition to the fact that you can write web servers, like you could write that HTTP server from before, you don't even have to do that. You can, you can build HTTP servers with zero lines of Python using the Twisty uh, command line utility. So here is a default built into Twisted web server. If you run this, if you install Twisted and you run this line, this will install a web server, that will spin up a web server that is listening for connections on port 8000 and will serve static and dynamic content out of the current directory. What if you want a DNS resolver? You could do that, resolving um, you know, name to IP address mappings out of a file called host in the current directory on port 5553. What if you want an SSH server? Assuming that you've set up SSH keys already, you could run this, <laughs> and there you go, you're done. How about a POP3 server? <laughs> um, 
from you know, storing content to somewhere, some directory in slash temp, or even an SMTP relay. I could go on with these all day, like until you get bored. Um, the point, though, is that uh, these are all using, they're reusing the same concepts we've already talked about. They're reusing this idea of transports and protocols and a reactor and deferreds and this application infrastructure. And they're all using the same bits and pieces. So TwistD is running a mail server that uses all of these concepts. And if you wanted to customize your mail server, you could steal the implementation that is used by TwistD, that is being run by TwistD. And you could subclass, you could extend it yourself. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I flip through these, like this is really exciting. The fact that I can run any of these things from the command line with zero configuration is, well, you know, command line configuration is, is pretty amazing. It's a pretty amazing starting point, at least, for developing your own custom implementations of protocols. I think that's very cool. Um, as evidence of the fact that Twisted um, definitely provides a service, uh, it fills a niche in the Python community, there is a huge number of uh, libraries built on top of Twisted. So these are just some. These are just pulled from Launchpad. I mean, I didn't even try to look at GitHub. I mean, there are definitely many um, projects that use Twisted uh, extensively for some of their you know, uh, server-type server operations. So that is what Twisted is. It's an event-driven framework for building clients and servers for a variety of networking protocols, not just ones that are built into Twisted, but also your own. Uh, it takes the batteries included philosophy very seriously, and it gives you um, a lot of rope to not only write and deploy, but deploy production-grade applications. Um, so an interesting, it's interesting how history evolves, right? So an interesting thing that, that, ha that happened earlier this year is that, um, so remember how I said earlier that Twisted doesn't actually come, doesn't, or sorry, Python, the Python core language does not have um, asynchronous I.O. primitives. Like to this day, it doesn't. Um, so the creator of Python, Guido Van Rossum, um, started getting into this a couple of months ago and started a discussion on Python ideas about uh, bringing uh, asynchronous I.O. primitives into the Python core language. Um, and he, of course, consulted lots of uh, relevant parties who have experience in this space. He certainly talked to a lot of Twisted folks, he talked to G-Event folks, he talked to a bunch of folks. Um, and they're moving forward with a proposal to add primitives, um, many of which are directly inspired by Twisted, into the Python core language, which uh, if it's all on track, it, it would um, be incorporated for the next major version of Python, Python 3.3. So this is a quote from the proposal. They would like to include an event loop, a reactor, uh, transport and protocol abstractions, uh, similar to those in Twisted, as well as a couple of other useful constructions for building um, event-driven programs. So I think this is kind of cool. I mean, it's interesting what happens when you're dealing with a language that doesn't give you these things for free. So, you know, for, so for decades, essentially, Python didn't give you these things for free, so there was this interesting ecosystem that built up around how you deal with event-driven programming in Python. You have these modules like AsyncCore, and you have these projects like Gevent, and you have these really big monolithic projects like Twisted, um, trying to tackle this problem in a way that's useful for people right now. Uh, but we're coming around on that, and it looks like we're gonna get um, these primitives in the language, and it'll be interesting to see how Twisted and how these other libraries end up sort of interoperating with these changes to the core language. So that'll be really cool. Um, and I would encourage you to think about, so a lot of you raised your hand about being Python users, but I'd be in interested to hear from or have us think about together um, what this, what the story looks like in other languages, languages where having strong async primitives has been present for a really long time. Like how do those, how do the libraries around asynchronous I.O. evolve differently in languages where the situation is different, where the primitives exist from the beginning? Perhaps where a language was designed from the beginning to care about these things differently. Um, and another thing to think about, something that I think about all the time, is that um, Twisted, to fill this niche, having this ready to use off the shelf, batteries included, event-driven networking library, is something of a beast. I mean, it's a pretty monolithic library that not only gives you this protocol support, but this you know, deployment management stuff and this application level stuff. Um, and this is both good and bad. 
you know, this means that Twisted is immediately useful. Like if you go install Twisted, you can run something useful in Twisted basically immediately. It also means that um, Twisted uh, perhaps sacrifices some simplicity in an effort to be general and extensible. And this can give Twisted a reputation for being a little bit scary, maybe a little bit complicated, maybe a little bit hard. Um, and, and that's an interesting architectural decision that was made when designing Twisted. Like there was a deliberate choice to make Twisted a big batteries included monolithic framework that is useful at the expense of complexity. So I, you know, it's interesting to think about as you go through your lives and you build open source software, you build software for work, is this a good choice or is this a bad choice? There are definitely trade-offs, right? And that is Twisted. So event-driven, clients and servers for any protocol you want. Um, it's a really useful tool to have in your back pocket. I find that I need to use Twisted all the time. Like once you're comfortable with the primitives, you find yourself wanting to test web servers and to write web clients. And I, you know, gee, is I do need another IRC Markov bot. Um, and just a, you know, a variety of things come up uh, for which Twisted is a very convenient and compelling and quick way of solving the problem. So I definitely encourage you to check it out. Um, I liked Twisted so much that it was the first ever open source project that I contributed to, and this was long ago, and I've been a core maintainer ever since. It's a bunch of really nice, smart folks, so I definitely encourage you to check it out. I even love Twisted so much that I wrote a book about it. <laughs> um, so this actually just came out like last week, but ta-da. Um, okay, so that is Twisted, and I'm interested in if you have any questions or comments or your experiences in languages other than Python about how you evolve event-driven ecosystems. I would definitely be interested to hear from you. Sure. So the question, well, because this is a little bit of an involved question, but so part of the question was, does the global interpreter lock in Python affect Twisted's performance? So Twisted is, um, and its most basic form, it's still a single threaded program. Um, so, uh, so that's what it is at the end of the day, and it's not like you have a multi-threaded program where you're, you're not getting true, true parallel execution of these threads. So you don't even have to worry about it from that perspective. My other answer to that is that people love hating on the gill, but it's actually a really complicated topic, and whether or not your performance is actually impacted by the global interpreter lock uh, is actually, uh, it's not obvious, and it's hard to tease out. And Dave Beasley has a really interesting talk on teasing out what the actual performance uh, concerns are. Um, and so, for example, if you're running um, a, a lot of um, expensive code is run outside of the global interpreter lock. So if, like, if you're waiting on an event, an I.O. event, or you're doing like a NumPy expensive computation, that stuff is actually done outside the GIL and it's not actually impacting you. So the answer to your question is complicated, but Twisted is fundamentally a single-threaded program in its most basic form. Yeah, that, that, that was my question. Okay. Yeah, you, but you, you, but you definitely can. And one of the so sometimes you really need to. So in particular, let's say that you want to use a third-party library. Oh, so a great example of this is databases. So like, uh, you know, you can use you know there are Python bindings for whatever SQLite and Postgres and MySQL and all of these things, right? And those interfaces are blocking typically. So um, Twisted provides a layer on top of these DB API to compliant bindings using threads behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about them, but using threads behind the scenes um, to get um, uh, an asynchronous, to get a, an API that appears to be asynchronous. Um, so Twisted gives you the rope that you need to deal with threads and processes in an event loop safe way, which is one of the virtues of having this framework. Like it really has thought about and done a lot of the hard work for that for you. Yes? So the question is, can you extend Twisted to use something like a C++ library? So you can in so much as you can with Python. So um, C++, um, I'm less sure about, but certainly you can write C extensions to Python. I mean, people do that all the time if there are, if you have, um, you know, tight performance loop things you want to be doing at a, you know, closer to the metal than in Python. You can certainly do web services in Twisted. You mean writing an HTTP server? Well, no, I think about serving up 
uh, so oh yeah absolutely absolutely and again with being this giant framework so um, twisted and I didn't even have a chance to talk about this but twisted comes with um, you know like uh, soap and XML and like an AMP serialization protocol and like various other um, serialization format compatibility things as well. So yeah, it definitely takes care of all of that stuff on that front. Or, or there are third party libraries on top of Twist that do it for you, yeah. Yes? If I were going to install it, what are the dependencies, what do I need? Uh, yeah, so you need Python and you need um, zope.interface uh, for um, enforcing some of these ab I, you might call them an abstract base class, but you don't really have that in Python. Anyway, to, to enforce some of the interface constraints, it uses this thing called Zope interface. And then for um, particular sub-projects, you may need additional dependencies. So for example, if you're building an SSH server, you uh, need some sort of um, like crypto Python libraries. And it, you know, there are various ones you can use that are compatible with Twisted. Do you know anything about uh, running Twisted on Broker? On that. Um, that's a really good question. Um, was it? Oh, shoot, yeah. The question was, um, can you run Twisted on Heroku? I'm, I'm not super familiar with Heroku's e ecosystem in general. Does anybody happen to know? I mean, can you just run Python in general on Heroku? You can run, so I, I run a Flask application. I'm pretty sure there's some sort of tornado support. I just didn't know if there was anything Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if you like Tornado, you'll be happy to know that there's a Tornado uh, twisted bridge, so you can actually get the um, event loop benefits of twisted from Tornado. Um, basically, everything has bridged with twisted because it's such a granddaddy in the ecosystem. Other questions? Horror stories, war stories, multi-threading program stories. What time is it? Fair enough. Um, for people who um, like thinking about callback management, I'm happy to talk about you as a bon about offline with you as a bonus thing. This um, additional syntax for managing callbacks called uh, well, it uses this thing called an inline callbacks decorator, and this uses a bunch of interesting features of Python. I will not trouble you all as a group with this, but it's kind of a cool combination of some fun things that are possible in Python. So. It's a bonus thing for some people. So after we all buy your book to get started with Twisted, uh, what, Thanks, what's a good way to get involved in the community to maybe start doing some work? Oh, sure. Um, so, uh, so the Twisted uh, community is super friendly, and you should totally come to our IRC channel and hang out and join our mailing list. Um, we have a great, uh, we have, it's a very mature project, right? So, so uh, we know how to handle new contributors, and we have excellent new contributor guidelines, and we have bite-sized bugs, and we have a strict test-driven development policy, which um, will make you a better programmer if you're not used to programming in that way. Um, and a great first project to work on Twisted is to build an IRC chatbot or a web server, um, really whatever strikes your fancy. But there are a lot of really great complete examples on the website. So. Yes? Is it possible to use Iron Python in Twisted? Um, so Twisted doesn't care about the underlying Python implementation in general. Um, I say in general because I know that Twisted mostly runs on PyPy, but sometimes doesn't. Um, so uh, presumably or probably. Um. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. Um, if you want to talk to me about inline callbacks and coroutines and generators up here, I'm happy to talk about them. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your time.